a crack or a defect around the tip of that scope can cause a water leak. And that water leak, unless it's picked up early on, can be a home for a pseudomonas. Public health. It's on everyone's mind these days, from hand washing to emerging pathogens. Welcome to Transmission Control, an infection prevention podcast focused on your appetite for trailblazing thought, discussion, and innovations that will help you make informed decisions. Each episode, we speak with public health experts and safety champions from across the globe as they share their experiences, passion, and opinions. From investigative journalism to medical publications, we tackle real-world barriers to halting the spread of disease. Whether you are tuning in for education, inspiration, or to hear the stories that need to be told, thank you for joining us. And now, get ready to blast off with your weekly injection of insight on transmission control. This week on Transmission Control, we speak with Dr. Stephen Snyder, Chief Medical Officer at Pristine Surgical and founding partner of the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. And Larry, today we're going to be talking about an area that I think is near and dear to your experience, which is really endoscopy and talking about arthroscopes in particular. So these are scopes that help you visualize joints in procedures such as knee replacements and also repairs such as ACL injuries, a lot of those sports injuries that you hear lots about. But we're going to be talking about the movement towards single-use devices and how that plays in both from an infection control perspective, but also a financial perspective. Dr. Snyder is going to be giving us some insights today, Larry. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting topic, and and there's three issues here in particular. The first one you've mentioned and we're going to focus on is the single-use arthroscope or instrumentation versus the reusable arthroscope. What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? In addition, we're talking about some of the differences you also alluded to and similarities between flexible endoscopy and rigid endoscopy, and then we'll talk about some of the differences between heat sterilization and low temperature sterilization and that evolution of the design of the instrument where it was originally intended to be steam sterilized. And then some data suggests that maybe low temperature sterilization can achieve the same outcome without being as rigorous on the materials, the adhesives, and the glues of that rigid instrument. A very important topic, single use versus reusable. It's not going away. It's it's here to stay and, and we'll address it today. All right, we're going to be right back after a short break with Dr. Steven Snyder. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Dr. Lawrence Muscarella. From 17 Studios, let's get into it. This is Transmission Control. Joining us now is Dr. Steven Snyder, Chief Medical Officer at Pristine Surgical and founding partner of the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk about arthroscope reprocessing and associated infections and infection risk. Great. One of my favorite topics. Well, why don't we talk about your background a little bit and you can tell us how it became one of your favorite topics. You know, I've been in practice here at SCOE for 41 years. When we first started, we used scopes that actually had to be covered with a plastic sheath in order to have a sterile environment. Through the years, the scopes have improved so that they can now be sterilized, but there's never been a surgical scope that has been single-use and pre-sterilized. So when I heard about this project, I got very excited about it because sterilization has been one of the biggest focuses we have, in, of course, in all of surgery, but in particular outpatient arthroscopy. So why don't we start talking a little bit about arthroscopy and where it was in the past. I'm going to kind of take this like past, present, and future you know, almost like Scrooge, (laughs) but like the three ghosts. But I kind of do want to just talk about that in the context so that anybody who's not familiar amongst all the infection preventionists with specifics around arthroscopy, can you talk about what it was like in the beginning? And then we'll transition from there. 
Sure. When I started practice in 1981, the arthroscope was actually a very crude tool. It was used by holding the scope with your fingertips and looking inside the ocular, the eyepiece with your eyeball. You can imagine if you have a scope puncturing into a knee or a shoulder at that time, the chance of contamination was pretty high because you couldn't cover your face in the scope. But as soon as cameras were developed, we had the ability to couple a video system onto the end of the scope and transmit a fiber optic light down to illuminate the joint. We were able then to be further away from the contamination area, have that area further away from the opening in the patient's body. But the big important change occurred when we were able to manufacture small arthroscopic cameras that would go with scopes that could all be put in the flash or the the autoclave to sterilize or, in some cases, soak. And then we were able to decrease the amount of potential infection caused by the arthroscopic procedure. So this is what what's happened over the past 40 years, and it's taken that long. Now we can talk about the potential benefits that we're looking for with the pristine scope. All right, Dr. Snyder. So you kind of talked a little bit about some of the improvements that are bringing us into the current state, right? We have cameras that are attached. You know, that does make it a lot easier to not contaminate the scope during the procedure. But what about even just to something as simple as procedure times? Like how long did some of these cases take, you know, 40 years ago in the beginning versus how long the procedures last nowadays? Well, the the procedures are much quicker now because the visualization is so much better and the preparation time and application time of this new technology. Simply, at this stage, we peel open a package that's been run through the entire sterilization process, and then that gives us a pre-sterilized set of tools, including the scope and the camera and the light source. So it's much quicker now than in the old days when we had to literally cover with a long plastic tube, literally cover the scope, the cables, because they were on the sterile field, and put a seal around the eye cup on the scope. That was uh, really arduous. Setup time. Just setup time was so much longer. That's correct, both for the surgical team and for the prep team setting up the equipment and the recorders and everything was was so much longer. And remember, we were rookies at that time. That We were just developing the technology. So I don't think there anybody was a, a, a pro at that time. So, so, Dr. Snyder, you're talking about kind of being a rookies at that time and there being an evolution where we're kind of moving into the single-use world. But let's go back to the beginning, the middle, and the end. And let, let's address two issues in particular that are of interest to the audience. And the first one will be a design evolution, and the second we'll talk about the infection rate evolution. Is it increasing, decreasing? Is technology really helping us? Have we plateaued? Where are we? But So let's go back to the design issue. You talked about earlier in the beginning, the arthroscope might just be covered with a plastic sheath, and that would create this barrier so that that reusable device could be used on multiple patients without presumably transmitting disease. So that was the starting point. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I understood you to say it. And then we went from that into the reprocessing world, and I would like you to talk a little bit about reprocessing. We have the cleaning of the arthroscope first for reusable devices, and then we get into steam. Did we go directly into the gravity steam sterilization process, and then at some point move into flashing? And then did we move into low temperature sterilization? And where in this spectrum of reprocessing technologies and modalities, where was high level disinfection? So could you go back from beginning to end and talk a little bit about how we moved from that sheath possibly to disinfection to heat and or low temperature sterilization? Sure. You know, we've tried all kinds of different methods. 
And you're right, in the beginning, our understanding of the contamination or sterilization necessary really wasn't anywhere near what it is now. We would have the scope, which we would clean in our crude fashion. The scope itself came wrapped and ready to insert. It was the camera attachment that needed to be protected. Initially, we just used our eyeball, and there's no way to sterilize your eyeball. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'd have to put it up against the ocular of the scope. So that was always a potential contamination barrier, as well as the water coming from the scope to your face mask or your goggles, again, potentially contaminating the field. But shortly after that, around 1982, was the first time I personally used a separate camera. And that camera was a, a big camera. It weighed about 13 pounds. It was made by a Japanese company and very good quality camera, but it was so heavy that it took a yeoman to hold it up. It took away an assistant's ability to assist in surgery, but at least we could see things on the screen. There was a secondary viewing portal that would clip onto the eye cup, and an assistant could put his or her eye to that viewing portal, and it was like a little umbilicus going from the main ocular to a remote site, and that was often, often where the, the big camera would be attached until we were able to get smaller containable cameras. And of course, the first cameras, like like you say, were really not stable to modern sterilization. We had to use low temperature sterilization or eventually chemical sterilization because the camera itself wouldn't withstand the stresses of high pressure, high temperature sterilization. Did you see when you're moving from that steam and that thermal sterilization, when you moved then into the low temperature sterilization, did you notice yourself changes in the infection rate where maybe the low temperature was not as effective as the high thermal steam sterilization, or did you notice no change in the baseline infection rate? No, I think all in all, as a surgeon, I didn't really notice. I think the reasons were multiple, one being the fact that we were better at keeping things clean. We started to isolate the fluid. We had different types of drapes, you know, things that made surgery altogether better. The fact that the camera could be cleaned and sterilized without damaging it was an important part of it. Also, we started doing outpatient surgery, which improved our infection rates. And we didn't keep people in the hospital where, as you know, infections are always higher. So I think it was a combination of our improving technology and understanding of contamination and as well as the technology getting better. Did did you practice flash sterilization routinely? Did you find a pressure of instrument inventory that would cause you to need to maybe not send the instruments down to central supply for thorough cleaning and complete sterilization and maybe more locally reprocess these devices? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about where we're moving into single use. But can you address that a little bit about the niche of flash sterilization, what your thoughts are on it? the benefits of it and some concerns you may have with it? Sure. I remember when it first came out and we thought it was going to solve all our problems. And actually, we actually went a little bit backwards with Flash. We don't use it anymore as a routine, but only for like a... Emergency uh, yeah, situation. Yeah, I hate to call it emergency. <laughs> that scares people away. But if if we happen to run low on our inventory of cameras or scopes, yeah, it's it's okay to flash sterilize, but but that's not our routine anymore. And the reason we changed was as you're alluding to it, it wasn't as good. Well, it's it's definitely harmful to the scope itself in a reprocessed in a scope that can be reprocessed because you have different ad adhesives 
seals, and they heat and cool at different paces. They don't heat and cool and expand and contract at the same rate. And so as a result of that, they can become separated. That can allow fluid to get inside of the scope. Obviously, the scope can't be decontaminated if there's a break in the seal because there's really no IFU or instructions for use for a technician to clean that that area of the scope because it's meant to be a sealed device. And so that that's definitely a big issue. With flash sterilization, it's more rapid heating and cooling because there's no real dry time and the cycle doesn't cool down slowly before the device is removed, you know, from the autoclave. So that's a challenge. And then just the the guidelines in the industry to eliminate immediate use, you know, flash obviously retermed immediate use steam sterilization to a lot of facilities are trying to get to zero because of the potential infection rates there too. So lots of reasons to move away from flash or immediate use steam sterilization nowadays. Good points, Justin. Very good observations. So, Dr. Schneider, do you think the immediate use sterilization with that lack of a drying time, can you address a little bit maybe about what specific organisms are you concerned about in general? And I'd like to talk a little bit about the Pseudomonas species, that being a kind of indigenous to water supplies. And when I see and have studied some outbreaks linked to arthroscopes and orthopedic instruments, they often are associated with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And when I hear of that organism, I think of a water supply, I think of moisture. Can you comment a little bit on that with regard to Pseudomonas infections linked to the type of arthroscopic procedures you were performing? Were they coming from the environment? How were they being introduced into this setting? Where were they coming from? Is, is the type of sterilization process or the way that the device was being cleaned, is, is that playing a role in this? Well, you know, Pseudomonas is pretty rare. Most of the infections that we've seen in our center have been skin contaminants like, you know, staph mm-hmm. and strep. Pseudomonas, of course, is frightening, and it does usually have a moist environment to at least allow the bacteria to fester. If there's a crack in the scope or if there's a a leak in the camera, you know, the two pieces are really separate now. The camera is one piece and the scope is another, and then they're fit, fitted together at the time of surgery. And there's various devices to do that. There's actually screw couplers, or there's what's called the C-mounts, which is a coupler that just goes on the outside of the eye cup. They're probably both both about equal amounts in the industry. But both of them have the potential, both the scope which is a long rod filled with multiple glass lenses with a tip on the end that's that's subject to a fair amount of trauma when it meets a shaver in the joint. A crack or a defect around the tip of that scope can, can cause a water leak. And that water leak, unless it's picked up early on, can be a home for a pseudomonas. Interesting. And in the world of flexible endoscopy, in the last five years, there's really been this federal movement to transition from the completely reusable device to the endoscope that is at least partially disposable, if not completely disposable. The impetus for that was the infections that were being associated with duodenoscopes, in particular, a type of endoscope used in the upper GI tract. And with bronchoscopes, for example, but particularly the duodenoscopes. So really the motivating factor to move from reusable toward disposable components or completely disposable endoscopes was the complexity of the design of the instrument that then was associated with the increased risk of infection. In arthroscopy, can you discuss a little bit about that infection rate and then what would be the primary impetus why a customer would want to move from a reusable arthroscope to a single-use arthroscope? You know, I I know that our podcast today is mostly to talk about infections, and that's a big driver for use of single-use scopes, as you mentioned. In our business of arthroscopy, that isn't anywhere near the rate of potential infection as you would see in a gastrointestinal scope, even a 
a bronchoscope or something like that. The scope that the GI doctors use, especially the flexible ones, are, are considerably more complex, more moving parts, more open channels, more fuss factor. With the arthroscope, it's simply a telescope with a camera on the end. And the benefit of single use far surpasses simply the infection. But because this is our, our focus today, you know, when you calculate or read the literature about the percentage of infections, so much depends on the, the customers, the center, the environment, the, the skill and experience of the surgeon, all the stuff that goes along with being a pro in a, a certain field. In our centers, I can say that the infection rate is way below 1%. And in mine in particular, because I only do shoulders now, the shoulder is a cleaner environment than, say, the ankle or the hip or someplace like that, where the infection rate's a little higher. So let's talk about some of the limitations of the arthroscope. And I think you kind of did that a decent amount here, but... The limitations of a reprocessable arthroscope versus single use, and that's kind of really where we're headed. We've touched upon it, but we haven't really summarized it. We had, you know, kind of talked a little bit about single use makes it easier for prep and getting set up. And we talked about some of the limitations with scopes that are reprocessed and the risk for infections there. But can you kind of just summarize the advantages of going and I should say advantages and disadvantages of going to a single-use arthroscope specifically. There's lots of single-use devices out there already, but I think endoscopy is kind of the emerging area, and especially as it relates to arthroscopes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It took a long time for technology to move into the scope visualization field. And part of the reason being that the system is so complicated. You need to put a real powerful light through some kind of a light conductor to light up the body cavity. You have to have magnification. You have to have a a real crystal clear picture. And until cell phone video technology and the like came to the fore and became cost-effective and available, we weren't able to do that. And that's why we use the scopes with the complicated light bundles, the fiber optics to conduct the light into the cavity, and the lens system, series of polished lenses inside a tube with a very expensive sapphire cut tip on the end. These things were what was required in order to do the job. But when microchips became available on the cell phones and, you know, everything else in life, and our team discovered that you could actually put a chip with 1080p visualization on the end of a rod and put it in the joint, as long as you used a LED light transmission, it made all the world of difference. And that allowed us to go forward with the engineering to create a scope that was cheap enough that it could be disposed of and could be sterilized in a package so that it could be zipped open and and used within a matter of seconds. Do you find the optics with the single use? We've talked a little bit about compatibility, maybe a little durability. But what about the optics in terms of seeing all the tissues that you need to see in the shoulder or the ankle? or in the hip, is the single-use device more than adequate? Does it have some work and some refinements still to undergo in order to become optimal? Or is the visualization close to optimal for the single-use arthroscopes as of today? I think the best single-use arthroscope today wouldn't stand up side to side with the best 4K three-chip standard scope. With one chip on the tip of a single-use scope, that chip can be optimized to give an absolutely beautiful picture. But side to side, you'd still notice a little 
improvement in the three chip. It only makes sense. There's more pixels and and more clarity. But and what is the clinical relevance of the improvement there? We know in GI endoscopy, for example, optics are so crucial to detect precancerous, small precancerous polyps, for example, and we do a colonoscopy, we have to have optics so that we don't miss them. You're bringing up a very good point that the optics may not be as good with the single use, but clinically, is that really significant? Well, that's that's a great way to look at it. Clinically, the answer is no. For 30 years or more, we, we use 720p and then 1080p optics. You know, I pretty used to doing this kind of thing. And I've tested several times side by side, 4K, you know, state of the art scope compared to a 1080p scope. I can't tell the difference. The difference is in you, you're allowed to advertise it as a 1080p <laughs> scope. And similar maybe to even our the HD TVs to your point. Well, and we're we're going in in the single use scopes, they've got high definition and they've got almost every optimization of the picture. It's sixty frames per second rather than thirty frames per second. And it's got all of the potential software optimization that you could ever want. So for you to look at the picture without a side-by-side comparison, you wouldn't notice any any derogatory degradation of the image, I'm, I'm quite certain. So as we wind down, Dr. Snyder, can you discuss a little bit of this knowledge that you have so much of with regard to arthroscopes? Is this also all transferable to other types of rigid telescopic devices such as a laparoscope? Is this really the same beast or is laparoscope, a single-use laparoscope, quite different from a single-use arthroscope? And maybe clarify for the audience whether you you even know whether there is a single-use laparoscope, but are they transferable? Can one really be a precursor to the other or are they two entirely different beasts? No, they're very similar. They're related in that the platform is the same. You know, the scope, the telescope is different. For a laparoscope, of course, it's got to be three times longer and a little wider diameter. Right. The arthroscope is five millimeters with a, a six millimeter sheath, and the laparoscope's larger than that. And it needs more light because the belly cavity is larger and it absorbs more light. So you need to transmit more light for a laparoscope. But the platform's the same. That means the software the dynamic HD processing, it's all the same. The chip is a little larger, but again, the same thing. So in answer to your question, with the upcoming systems available, there are plug and play modifications where you can take the handpiece, which has all of the software and the the circuit board, and plug in a different tip and you can go from an arthroscope to a thoroscope or a cystoscope or a laparoscope. Sim- or nephroscope. Or nephroscope. Now, of course, the flexible scopes are different, but it's the same idea. Again, the same platform, but much more complicated device. And because of the need to biopsy and the need to wash and that type of stuff, which you don't do with the other scopes. Fantastic interview. And before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you one last kind of open-ended question, just because we talked about this when we connected to talk about having you on the show. And something I think you were kind of passionate about was the potential for remote learning and whether that's not really specific to single use or, you know, scopes that can be reprocessed. But I think it was something that you were You were very excited about it's the potential for remote learning. Can you talk a little bit about that as we wrap up? Yeah, I can. I was born an educator, and I think part of the reason was I'm not the brightest guy in the world. So I learned and developed my expertise by sharing ideas. And then if I teach, I have five fellows here working with me in the office. Fellows are fully trained orthopedic surgeons who then want to become expert in arthroscopy. So they give up a year of their time after their postgraduate to come and and work in the office. Fellowship training is 
probably one of the most exciting things that you can do as a senior surgeon because you can share ideas. But what if you could do that a around the world. I mean, we do that with telebroadcasts and this type of thing. But if you had a scope in your operating room connected to the internet instantly and a channel, of course, with the permission of the, of the patient and everybody, that you could broadcast that scope image without any degradation and share your ongoing teaching with interested people around the world, I think that would be valuable. All right. Fantastic interview, Dr. Snyder. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You bet. Thank you, guys. We'll meet again in the future. That was Dr. Stephen Snyder, Chief Medical Officer at Pristine Surgical and founding partner of the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. And we're talking about this move towards single-use devices, but specifically in endoscopy and we've already seen it in GI or, or gastrointestinal. We've begun to see it, obviously, in arthroscopy. And then, Larry, I thought you asked a great question about, you know, how applicable is this in laparoscopy as well? But these procedures brought with them what they're termed as minimally invasive surgery – Instead of opening a patient up and literally making an incision and exposing their insides, you know, to the whole outside environment, which we try our best to control in the operating room, minimally invasive surgery allowed us to make a couple of small cuts and introduce instruments and expose a lot less of the internal organs of the patient. So that naturally right. reduced infections. But it didn't right. eliminate infections. And so single-use devices is a movement not only for the cost savings that Dr. Snyder was describing at the very end, but also for continued improvements around infection. Yes, I think a real driving force when, let's say, you put your salesman hat on and you're talking to a big hospital group and you want to sell a single-use device, certainly if the cost of the single use can be shown to be less than the cost per procedure for reusable device that has to be reprocessed, cleaned, sterilized, it makes a compelling argument for the single use. But there's two other important points that we talked about that is a purchasing consideration, if you will, for uh, moving a hospital group moving from reusable to single use. And it's in addition to cost, it has to do with the visualization is the patient clinically, is the patient's safety suffering? For example, if we're in flexible endoscopy, we talk about the importance of visualization of, of somewhat small polyps that might otherwise even be undetected. So it seems that this issue of visualization with the single-use rigid instruments is where it needs to be. But one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about is really the supply chain implications that go to the single-use device as opposed to reusable. Maybe we can get a guess that we can address that another time. But I think the whole movement is there needs to be a compelling argument, I think, that strengthens this move from reusable to single-use disposable devices, that the infection rate is demonstrably reduced, if not the cross-infection risk, eliminated altogether. And that's something that our data that all of us want to see. And I think we really should talk about that more in another podcast. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. But as a reminder, you can help support Transmission Control by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. We're also available on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or just search for Transmission Control on your favorite podcast application. You can also access bonus content for certain episodes, but you got to download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Larry and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transmission Control. Thank you.